Um, hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, so today's the third se um, series of the Specialisms in Biomedical Science talks. Um, we are recording this session, so it will be available online later. Um, we have had two more of these sessions, um, but I'm waiting to get all of them together before we release the recordings. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Can everyone please make sure they're on mute um, while the speaker is presenting? Um, you will have the opportunity to ask your questions later, so either raise your hand or use the chat function, which I'll be keeping an eye on throughout the session. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself and then hand over to Chelsea. Um, while I'm speaking, um, do you mind just using the chat function um, and just introduce yourself as in whether you're a student and if you are, what year you're currently studying on? Um, or whether you're qualified and where you're joining us from. It just gives us a bit of an idea on um, the audience, really. Um, so my name's Tamina. I'm a lecturer in biomedical science at the University of Salford. Um, prior to stepping into academia, I was working at Christie uh, for 12 years as a HCPC registered biomedical scientist specialising in haematology and blood transfusion. Um, and since joining there, I've sort of uh, gone on to complete my master's in haematology and transfusion and then uh, more training orientated. Um, so I do quite a bit of work with the IBMS as a portfolio verifier and examiner for specialist portfolios, um, CPD officer, and I also sit on council. Um, so I stepped into academia last year um, and I teach on the biomedical science degree. Um, and today we have Chelsea with us. I'm going to hand over to you, Chelsea, um, and you can do your introduction and then we can get started. Thank you. Thanks, Tamina, and thank you for asking me to speak today. So my name's Chelsea and I'm a specialist biomedical scientist at the North Bristol NHS Trust. I'm just going to share my slides. Hopefully you can all see that, OK? So I work within clinical immunology and the immunogenetics lab, and we are a regional testing centre in the southwest. So we do a lot of specialist immunology testing. I'm just going to briefly talk you through sort of how I got to where I am um, and sort of my special interests. And then we'll we'll get on to the, the nitty gritty of the immunology that we do. So I started with my A-levels. I did biology, chemistry and psychology. I then went on to Coventry University to study applied biomedical sciences and came out with a first class degree from there. I also did my placement year down in Derford Hospital in Plymouth um, in between my second and final year where I did my HCPC uh, certificate of competence portfolio so that when I graduated, I was registered and ready to go. I got my band five job at um, North Bristol NHS Trust um, for when I graduated. And then a year later, I was given a band six post. I completed my IBMS Clinical Immunology Specialist Portfolio in November of 2021. And I'm currently studying an MSc in Applied Transfusion and Transplantation Science at UWE, alongside doing the British Society of Histocompatibility and Immunogenetics Diploma. So I've also um, dabbled in mentoring. So Greenwich University run a mentoring scheme for their STEM students. So I've mentored uh, a few people throughout their final year of university, giving them sort of employability and transferable skills tips. Um, I did a presentation for the IBMS Support Hub. Um, Tamina invited me to do that, which was a really good opportunity. I've done some guest lecturing for Staffordshire University around autoimmunity and multiple myeloma. Um, lots of networking, especially on Twitter. One of my um, piece of advice for you would be get onto Twitter because the biomedical uh, science scene is huge on there and everybody's really lovely. I attended the Bishy conference and also presented my undergraduate research at the IBMS Congress um, via poster presentation. So just quickly, um, why biomedical science? So. Biomedical science was never my initial goal. I actually originally wanted to do medicine, um, but went to, to uni and did biomedical science and absolutely fell in love with it. I never used to really like labs either, um, but when I went on my placement, placement year, I, I quickly sort of fell in love with the lab work and clinical diagnostics and, and never looked back from there, really. So a day in the life of band six specialist BMS in immunology and immunogenetics. So I would spend the day checking and improving the quality control materials. So typically usually positive and um, negative quality control samples. 
uh, depending what assay you do. Sometimes they're numerical values that you compare against a known range as well. You plot them on a graph and make sure they're within the appropriate ranges to accept tests. I perform maintenance of analyzers, um, whether that be daily, weekly or monthly. Performing, as I previously said, the specialist testing. So a lot of immunology labs are a lot smaller, so they'll do sort of the bog standard routine work and then their samples get referred to us to do the more specialist um, testing. I supervise and train staff, so MLAs, um, associate practitioners and band fives. A lot of CPD and reflective practice is very important as biomedical scientists that we keep on top of that um, and, and reflect not only on what we've done well, but also things that have gone wrong so that we can learn from those mistakes. Lots and lots of troubleshooting. Um, I'm sort of the person that a lot of people will come to if they've got issues when running their analyzers or their QC doesn't seem quite right or there's issues with samples, maybe they need to be rejected. I also write SOPs, conduct audits on processes within the lab to highlight any non-conformances where things have gone wrong or things that we need to improve. I'm also a fire warden and first aider, so I wear many hats in the lab. So on to the immunology. I'm going to just give you a brief overview of, of immunology and the immune system so that then when I talk about the testing and some conditions later on, you've just got a little bit of, of context, but I'm sure um, most of you are already aware. As, you, as I said, it will be a very brief overview. So it's a biological. Disease and infection and also helps to differentiate between self and non self. So what's foreign and what's not foreign um, within your body. So we've got some main components of the immune system. Your skin is, is one of the main um, organs that is used to protect against infection and disease, so it acts as a barrier. You've then got uh, your thymus, your spleen, your lymph nodes, so that's your storage of white blood cells in effect. You've also got your tonsils, adenoids and appendix, which act as um, sort of like barriers to infection again. So when you end up with tonsillitis, that's because your tonsils have become infected to prevent that from entering your respiratory tract. As I'm sure most of you are aware, um, your immune system is split into, into sort of branches. So you've got your innate immunity, adaptive, and then you've got the complement cascade. So your innate immunity is non-specific immunity. It happens within um sort of several hours or a day following the presence of either um a wound that's infected or infected with a pathogen that is not um is foreign to the body so i'm sure a lot of you have cut yourselves before um if it's been slightly infected or an inflammatory response has been stimulated you'll notice redness around the wound maybe um you'll get some pus leaking out. So that is your inflammatory response where your acute phase proteins are upregulated to be able to try and clear any um, foreign pathogens from that area so that wound healing can occur, can occur um, and your body can then dampen down your inflammatory response. So the main sort of um, job of the innate immune system is to recruit immune cells so that the foreign pathogen could be phagocytosed and di directed against apoptosis and apoptotic pathways to clear that pathogen. Um, and one way that it does that is by activating complement, which I'll go on to in a minute. So your key components of your innate immune system are mast cells, macrophages, neutrophils, dendritic cells and NK cells. Your mast cells release histamine and cytokines to further recruit more immune cells to the site of infection. Your macrophages phagocytose those pathogens, so eat them up in, in effect to clear them. Neutrophils discharge the DNA and um, sort of the cell contents of pathogens so that that can then be phagocytosed and cleared out of the system. And it does this by oxidative burst. Your dendritic cells are antigen presenting cells. And your NK cells are responsible for sort of initially tumour tumor killing. Um, release of perforin and granzymes, which then um, breaks the cell membranes to induce apoptosis. So the end goal is to clear these infected cells or clear the pathogen. Um, 
Your adaptive immunity is highly specific, so its immune memory occurs four to seven days after first being um, being infected with with the foreign pathogen, and it's mainly um, comprised of T and B cell responses. So your T cells deal with process forms of um, antigens and peptides and your B lymphocytes deal with their native form um, by attacking with antibodies. So following certain signals and cytokines, um, your B cells differentiate into plasma cells and antigen specific memory cells to be able to produce those specific antibodies to fight infection. And with antigen pre presentation, so this happens in adaptive but not in innate immunity. So the foreign antigens are presented as peptides by your MHC class one and class two molecules, um, utilizing either CD4 or CD8 positive T cells. And then the response goes on to either um, kill infected cells by CD8 cytotoxic T cells binding to the infected cell or CD4 positive T cells. Um, binding by B cell receptors to stimulate those to activate antibody secretion. We've also got the complement cascade. So it's a, a very sort of complex cascade where certain proteins are cleaved in a certain stage of the cascade, and then that promotes the next one down um, to be cleaved and so on and so forth until you get activation of these proteins in a cascade to ultimately ultimately create the membrane attack complex uh, to form uh, cell lysis and, and kill those infected cells. So dependent on which pathway um, is activated, it depends sort of they've got different ways to be activated. So your classical pathway is usually by antigen antibody complexes and your alternative pathways by my microbial peptides. Um, and they all feed in to the C3 component, which then activates and cleaves. So that then activates C5 and then that creates a C5, 6, 7, 8 and 9 complex to then form a pore in the membrane, which is the membrane attack complex. So I've just highlighted, oops, sorry, go back. I've just highlighted um, with those circles where actually the complement cascade can go wrong. So when everything functions, your body can fight infection and it all works and it's great. But sometimes things go wrong, which is what we look at in the immunology lab. So we've got some disorders of complement and these will probably, some of these slides will make a bit more sense once I go into the testing, but I wanted to just give you a background. So we've got um, C1 esterase inhibitor, which if I go back to this slide is, um, you've got the C1Q complex there, the, the blue sort of, I'll try and get my laser pointer if I can show you. Um, so this complex here. So along this pathway, you've got C1 esterase inhibitor, which actually stops the C1Q complex from activating C3. So once you have your body has lysed all the cells it needs to, um, you'd expect your complement and your immune system to dampen down and there's signals that help that happen. So C1 esterase inhibitor is one of those signals. If you have a deficiency, that doesn't happen, that dampening down. So it's usually, deficiencies are usually found in combination with malignancy um, or, or other autoimmune diseases. So you can get anti, autoantibodies that bind to C1 esterase inhibitor that stops it from then binding to the C1Q complex. Um, to then inhibit complement. So you get a consumption of complement, which then re results in low complement. So you can activate your um, C3 as much. So then your complement cascade can't lyse the cells properly. Um, with C1 ester esterase inhibitor deficiency, it is also referred to as hereditary angioedema. So you get significant swelling and um, significant edema of the body, typically of the face and the throat. And this is due to the um, increase in bradykinin. So I've just put an image over here just so that you can um, visualize it. The bradykinin pathway is, is just one pathway that's responsible for angiogenesis and the generation of new um, blood vessels. So if you have this deficiency, it results in an increase of bradykinin, which is a vasodilator. So your blood vessels dilate and then you get fluid moving out and into into sort of cavities and then you end up with swelling. 
There's also C3 nephrotic factor, which is an autoantibody that acts on C3 convertase. So this blocks the inhibitors, again, of C3 convertase resulting in complement con consumption. So your C3 here is constantly being cleaved um, into the into the other pathways by C3 convertase because it can't be inhibited. So then you're using your complement constantly. You can also get complement receptor deficiencies. So of CR3 and CR4, um, which are ultimately CD11B and CD18. So they're a cluster of differentiation markers. So different cells will express those on their surface. So this inhibits the binding of inactivated C3B and um, unbound form of this. So this needs to be bound to be able to recruit neutrophils so that they can adhere to your blood vessels and roll and then ultimately direct pathogen, pathogenic cells to phagocytosis. Whereas if you've got um, inactivated C3B that is unbound in your, in your system, this then means that neutrophils cannot be recruited to the site of infection on your endothelium, so the phagocytosis can occur. And then we've just got a few others. So um, you can get a deficiency of C3, um, which ultimately then means that your classical and alternative pathway, as they feed into each other, they will halt at C3. So if you've not got a, enough C3 to then cl um, help cleave the next proteins and activate those, you'll get a low functional activity of the classical and the alternative pathway. Um, so th this is just... Um, an acronym for the test that we use. So I'll show you that in, a bit later on. You can get deficiencies of C1Q, C2 and C4, which is quite common in um, SLE or lupus. So this then means that the immune compl complexes between autoantibody and self antigens, again, I'll go on to it in a minute, um, means that these complex immune complexes can't be cleared from the body. Um, so then that results in complement consumption. And it's quite common to get um, meningococcal infections, um, which come with a normal classical pathway um, function, but a low alternative pathway function. And these are due to factor D or factor B deficiencies. So this picture here is just showing you what the what a um, Neisseria infection looks like, which is common in a lot of these patients. So within the laboratory, we've got these, um, well, my laboratory anyway, we've got four sections. We've got immunochemistry, autoimmunity and allergy, immunophenotyping and histocompatibility and immunogenetics. So I'm just going to talk you through um, each section, what kind of testing we do, the principles behind the tests and, and some of the sort of I can't talk about all the conditions because I'm sure most of you know there are a lot. So I've just picked out um, sort of key ones that, that would be easier to explain um, and explain the pathophysiology. So we'll start with immunochemistry. So within immunochemistry, we have different methods of testing. So we use capillary zone electrophoresis, which utilizes silicon capillaries to be able to separate out serum into its constituent proteins. So um, it utilizes a osmo um, electric current. So the silanol um, particles in the silicone are ionized and then a buffer is passed through at a certain pH. It's important that the pH is, is what is required for the assay because if the pH changes, it can then change um, the ionic charge on some of the molecules. So then they're separated out by um, electroosmotic gradient mass and charge so you then um, get a trace of different proteins which I've got a picture of in a minute. We do specific protein and analysis by turbidimetry so we look at your immunoglobulins, we look at serum free light chains so kappa and lambda, we also uh, look at beta 2 microglobulin and we also look at seroplasmin as well. Um, we look at so we quantify C1 esterase for looking at the complement deficiency and we also do a functional test for that as well so not only do we quantify we look to see if it is actually working as it needs to be so turbidimetry works by adding a specific antisera to the protein that you want to identify and quantify and this is incubated in a cuvette with your sample 
and then light is shone through and the quantity of the protein is inversely proportional to the amount of light. So the more light that is able to be shone through the sample and detected by a photo detector, the less protein you have in that sample because the protein forms um, a, like a lattice with the antisera, so forms an immune complex in effect um, with the antisera that you add, creates a lattice that crosslinks and then allows the light sort of to be shone through relative to, to how much protein or not is in the sample. So we also perform serum and urine immunofixation. So this utilizes gel electrophoresis. So you add a sample to a gel, you pass an electric current over it, um, and then the proteins separate by, um, by mass. They tra travel from either the um, positive or negative um, electrode and they travel away. They can then be visualised by a acid violet stain. So after we've done the electrophoresis, we pop it into a stain box and um, it produces um, sort of a like a trace. So we always use a an ELP um, antisera, which allows to be able to identify to make sure that the gel is actually run co correctly because we can't run um, positive or negative quality control material on these gels because of the amount of space we've got on them and the amount of gels and samples that we actually run. Um, we have to use a sort of reference track. Again, I've got some pictures, so hopefully it will all become clear. So these tests are used mainly in the detection of multiple biloma and monoclonal proteins. So a monoclonal protein is when a a plasma cell um, proliferates uncontrollably and is able to produce mass amounts of a specific isotope of immunoglobulin. We perform radio diffusion assays, which is what we utilise for complement function. So we have a gel, an agarose gel, that either contains um, chicken or sheep erythrocytes, depending on which pathway of complement we want to activate. We then add the patient sample and we let it incubate. And um, if the if complement has been activated, when we go back to it in, in 24 hours time, we'll see a ring of lysis where that membrane attack complex has formed and the erythrocytes within the gel have been lysed. So we then measure those rings of lysis and convert them into a percentage so that we can report on the percentage function of complement. And then we also perform isoelectric focusing. So this separates out uh, proteins based on their um, isoelectric charge. So when um, when the molecules are turned into um, zwitter ions. And this is utilised for oligoclonal banding investigations into um, intrathecal IgG synthesis, um, which is common in multiple sclerosis. So as I've said, we utilise te this testing for monoclonal protein detection, um, oligoclonal banding, alpha-1 antitrypsin phenotyping. So um, they're this is a protein that enables um, clearance of neutrophil elastase in your smooth muscle. Um, and people that have a deficiency in alpha-1 antitrypsin are actually at more risk of emphysema and um, liver disease, so are advised not to smoke or drink. Um, alkaline phosphatase isoenzymes, so um, ALP, any, any patient that's got a raised ALP that's sign significantly raised, the sample will be referred to us so that we can determine the source of ALP. Um, so it can either come from your bones. A lot of patients with my multiple myeloma have, um, have bone lesions, so ALP is released from there, can be released from your liver or from your intestines. And then, as I've mentioned, complement function assays. Um, so this is the radial diffusion I was on about with the complement function. So you can see we've got rings of lysis here on this gel. So they would be measured and then determined into a percentage. Um, we also perform bowel cancer screening as well. So this is just the analyzer of the capillary zone electrophoresis. So this is your albumin peak, your alpha-1, which is where your alpha-1 antitrypsin sits, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2, and your gamma globulin zone. So this is where your immunoglobulins sit. Um, you can see in this one that, that actually the gamma globulin zone is slightly raised. It's not a very um, sharp peak, so to me it doesn't look like a monoclonal protein, so it may just be um, that someone's got hypergammaglobulinemia. 
So this um, patient actually has a monoclonal protein. You can see a very high, very sharp peak. And we do a thing called immunosubtraction. So we add anti-sera to a dilution well, add the sample, and then it's um, run through the um, CZD is what we call it for short. Um, and anything that's formed an immune complex stays in the capillaries and it loops out everything else. So if you look, you've got a blue reference, um, a yellow reference graph, sorry, and then blue over the top. And you can see that in the IgG and the kappa, the blue has completely disappeared. So this patient has an IgG kappa monoclonal protein, which is um, of quite, um, the quantification would be very high. So this patient possibly has myeloma. This is our turbidimetry analyzer. And then this is just some examples of the electrophoresis that we perform. So up here is a serum immunofixation. So something that we've identified on the capillary zone electrophoresis that isn't necessarily big enough to do that immunosubtraction, we will then um, do by electrophoresis. So this is the ELP um, track here, which acts as our quality control. We can see that the proteins have been separated out. Here's your albumin, alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2, and then you've got like a polyclonal um, population down here of your immunoglobulins. This is the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency phenotyping. So we were able to determine what genetic phenotype they have um, based off of this. And this is someone that's got an IgM lambda paraprotein. This is our um, alkaline phosphatase assay. And then this is our oligoclonal banding. We're looking for bands in the CSF that aren't present in the serum. And then we perform fecal Im immunochemical occult testing as well to identify hemoglobin in, in the feces for bowel cancer screening. So myeloma is a monoclonal gammopathy, a malignant plasma cell disorder, as I mentioned, with uncontrolled proliferation, mainly affecting older people, more common in men and twice more prevalent in black populations. Um, I've already covered all of this, so I'll just skip over these slides. On to autoimmunity. So we perform indirect immunofluorescence, which um, is we have slides that have tissue um, over the wells that's specific to the autoantibodies that we want to identify. So these um, serum sample is added to these slides and incubated. So any antibodies present in the serum will then bind to the tissues um, to their antigenic targets. And then we add a fluorescent um, conjugate to that complex. And if there's any immune complexes bound, this fluorescent conjugate will bind to that and it enables us to visualize it by um, UV microscopy. We also perform ELISA, so the either antigen or antibody um, is bound to the well, depending on what you're looking for. You add the sample, um, antigen or antibody in the sample will bind, um, and then usually you add a conjugate or a substrate to allow um, to visualize a color change or produce a a optical density so that can be determined into a numerical figure and we also do immunoblots so they um, confirm specificities of autoantibodies that are found in our indirect immunofluorescence so the immunofluorescence is just a screen really we can't determine the specificity of the antibody um, just by looking at a pattern on the fluorescence. So to be able to determine exactly what antibody it is, we then do an immunoblot. So it's a cellulose strip that has um, different sections on it with different antigenic targets bound. So you add your sample, any antibodies in that sample will bind to those antigenic targets on that strip in the specific place that it's in. And then a substrate is added to visualize a band. And then that's read by software and can determine exactly how strong the reaction is. So these are just some of the key conditions that we look for um, within the autoimmunity uh, section. So SLE, lupus, scleroderma, myositis, um, they're sort of multi-system connective tissue disorders. Overlap syndromes, um, celiac disease is one I'm sure you've all heard of, and then allergy, anaphylaxis, Addison's disease, which is um, antibodies against your adrenal tissues, type 1 diabetes, pemphigus and pemphigoid are skin, autoimmune skin blistering disorders, so their antibodies to certain proteins within the junctions and um, within the skin cells that actually 
um, are attacked by your autoantibodies. And because they're bound to autoantibodies, it means that your cellular junction can't adhere your cells properly. So your layers of your skin start to separate and cause blisters. And then anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody associated vasculitis and other renal conditions. So just a little bit on anaphylaxis. Um, so we test for mast cell tryptase um, within the lab for anaphylaxis testing. So we'll be referred samples um, and we need one at baseline. So about an hour um, after the reaction has happened, um, but without preventing life-saving treatment. So as close to the reaction as possible. Then a few hours later, just to see how the mast cell tryptase is is going and then 24 hours later to get a baseline um, so that we can compare. Some patients have just naturally higher mast cell tryptase than others so we need a baseline to compare um, the sort of reaction sample to if you like just to make sure that it is legitimate. So we also test for IgG and complement as well. Um, complement can be consumed during anaphylaxis and with life-saving treatment that they offer for anaphylaxis, sometimes hemodilution occurs so your blood gets diluted. So we measure IgG to see if the IgG is low. If the IgG is low, the complement is low um, and the, the mast cell tryptase that means the mast cell tryptase may have been diluted out by the treatment that the patient has been given. Um, but then the interpretation is typically up to our consultant clinical immunologist. So this is just a nice diagram to show you that on first exposure of the antigen, it's presented to your T cells, which then prompt your B cells to produce IgG against that specific allergen. Um, and then once the IgG is produced, when you're re-exposed, um, this IgG binds to your mast cells via FC receptors. The mast cells degranulate to release histamine and other mediate, mediators, and the histamine acts directly on smooth muscle, which is why you get constricting of the airways. So this is just a quick picture of some of the indirect immunofluorescence. Um, so we utilise human epithelial cells for anti-nuclear antibody detection. Uh, this is a homogeneous um, pattern, so you can see that the, um, in the mitotic cells, so the cells that are dividing, your chromatin is condensed in the middle and that's stained. So you've got some kind of antibody um, against the, the metaphase plate there, um, which can be seen sometimes um, in, in lupus. This is endomysial tissue. So we look for endomysial antibodies in celiac disease. Um, and this is Endomysium is present in your smooth muscle. So this is a um, esophageal slide. And then you can see that the endomysial is stained um, and, and fluoresces there. And then these are just some pictures of some of the slides that we have. Uh, this is what we look for in anchor associated vasculitis in some of the renal conditions. So here you've got a perinuclear stain of your neutrophils. And here, um, is a cytoplasmic stain of your neutrophils. This is a gastroparietal antibody, which is present in people with pernicious anemia. So that these antibodies prevent um, your stomach from being able to metabolize and absorb uh, vitamin B12. Um, it also affects your intrinsic factor so that pathway doesn't happen. And then these are your adrenal um, adrenal cells. So typically an adre a positive adrenal will have negativity, negativity towards the middle of the tissue and the staining gets stronger as you as you go out. So this is the analyzers um, that we use for a lot of different testing. So we test for anti double stranded DNA, which is present antibodies, which is present in, in lupus so It's one of the sort of main antibodies we look for in people with lupus. Um, this analyzer is also utilized for the specific allergen testing, also for the anaphylaxis mass subtriptase testing. So it's a random access um, automated analyzer uh, which utilizes ELISA technology. So you have a um, antigen or antibody bound to an uh, individual cap. Your sample gets added into that cap. Then you get your um, conjugate added, a development solution and a stop solution. Um, and these caps come in sort of little um, cartridges that almost look a bit like um, pens or pencils. So you load them onto the machine and it does everything for you. We also have um, an automated sort of plate ELISA 
machine as well, um, which will also read some of the manualizers we do. So we look for glomerular basement membrane antibodies, which are present in um, renal disease. MPO and PR3, uh, myeloperoxidase and proteinase 3 are the antigenic targets for the neutrophil antibodies that I mentioned previously. So after that um, anchor screen, we'll then go on and do the ELISA testing just to confirm if um, they have antibodies towards these specific antigenic targets or not. Um, CCP we look for in rheumatoid arthritis, um, PL, PLA2 and um, is for renal disease and ACHR is for a condition called myasthenia gravis, which is a neurological condition. Um, these antibodies, acetylcholine receptor antibodies are very rare, um, but we do get quite a few samples in for testing. And then this is just a picture of the immunoblotin that I mentioned as well. You can see here that you've sort of got the individual strips there and then you add the sample. The analyzer is actually automated, so it adds everything for you. And um, once you've set up, you just you press go and then wait for the results. So just a quick um, sort of whistle stop tour for SLE, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. So it's a complex chronic autoimmune condition that results in the inflammation, as I said before, of connective tissue. So it's sort of a, a multi-system um, whole body disorder. Sometimes you get this characteristic butterfly rash and it is a relapsing remitting condition, so you can have flare ups. Often we get samples from patients through just to check if their antibody levels or antibody teeters have, have increased or decreased, depending on what stage they're at in their disease. So some symptoms of fatigue, skin rashes, fevers, pain or swelling. Um, and sometimes these patients do have kidney disease due to immune complexes being formed in the kidneys um, and due to the vasculature and the structure of the kidneys. These are, are, are too big for the kidneys to be able to filter out, so it causes damage. So the pathophysiology is thought to be, um, so you have auto-reactive T cells, so your body is able to delete a lot of those T cells that have an affinity, a strong affinity to self, but sometimes it goes wrong. Um, a lot of the time people still don't know why. And um, there are several theories, but it's not it's not sort of defined. So these auto reactive T cells can escape the um, peripheral and central tolerance um, mechanisms and are able to activate auto antibody producing um, B cells, plasma blasts. Um, it can increase your neutrophil activation, which, um, as I mentioned before, the expulsion of DNA, that then becomes an antigenic target, which is where the anti double stranded DNA antibodies come in. Um, your dendritic cells then target the DNA as an autoantigen, releases interferon gamma, which is a really um, important cytokine in your immune response, um, and autoreactive T cell activation. So autoreactive B cells are supposed to be removed from your body, but it's thought that this is defective. Um, and the survival of these B cells and your autoreactive T cells can infiltrate tissues. And when looked at under histo um, Hist immunohistochemistry, you can see this um, typical lupus band, which is just a band of immune complexes formed. So as I've said, associated with anti-nuclear antibodies, double-stranded DNA and anti-Smith antibodies, it's just a different antigenic target. Um, we confirm that by ELISA and on your human epithelial cells and an immunoblot as well. And that's just some um, clinical and immunological criteria. So on to immunophenotyping. So within immunophenotyping, we look at um, immune deficiencies. We look at hemato-oncology, so blood cancer, and we also do HIV monitoring. So some of the key conditions within this department, we look at acute myeloid leukemia and um, acute lymphocytic leukemia. These are sort of the main two that come through the hemato-oncology side of things. Um, so we look at people's cells in their marrow and their blood and we characterise um, what markers are present and whether they're normal or abnormal, whether they're mature or immature cells. Um, myeloma, we also do some testing for as well. So if someone's um, been sort of referred to us as a new myeloma, we investigate to look at the phenotype of their plasma cells. So look to see if there are any um, neoplastic markers. Um, as opposed to normal myeloma expression on those cells, or normal plasma cell expression, sorry. We look at auto 
immune lymphative, lymphoproliferative disorders, uh, common variable immune deficiency, which I'll speak about in a minute, severe combined immunodeficiency, uh, chronic granular Thomas disease, which is a um, disease where your neutrophils don't function via the oxidative burst as they should do. It's an X-linked disease, so typically seen in males and it's um, X-linked recessive. And then leukocyte um, adhesion deficiency, which couples again with the, um, so I mentioned earlier about complement receptors, CD11, B and CD18. So if you've got absent, absence of those, which doesn't allow your neutrophils to adhere to your cell surface, um, you have something called leukocyte adhesion deficiency. So those adhesion molecules aren't present. Um, and quite often in children, it's seen as a delayed separation of the umbilical stump. So when you cut the umbilical cord, what's left um, typically usually falls off eventually um, within sort of a certain time frame. But with this children with this uh, disorder, actually one of the symptoms can be that that stump takes a, a long time to fall off. So we get various types of sample within the immunophenotyping section. So we get um, bone marrow samples, we get um, lymph nodes or core biopsies, which we have to then um, macerate with a scalpel to be able to release the cells because we can't just um, put a lymph node onto the flow cytometer because th the machine wouldn't be very happy with that. So we have to be able to release the cells first into a suspension to then be able to incubate with antibodies. And then also we get uh, cerebral spinal fluid from lumbar punctures. Um, we've actually seen an increase in, in the amount of those we're getting for investigation of lymphoma and um, leukemia within the central nervous system as well. So we get quite a few of those samples. So in the immunophenotyping section, we use a flow cytometer. Uh, so it separates cell populations based on size and granularity. So um, your forward scatter corresponds to the size of your cells and your side scatter corresponds to your granularity of your cells. So here we've got um, just sort of deb cell debris really. The aim when we're looking, so we look predominantly at white cells. So we use ammonium chloride to lyse the um, erythrocytes and red cells to remove those. And we then centrifuge to be able to get a nice pellet of white cells at the bottom of our tubes. Um, and ideally when we're running samples, we like this area to be as clean as possible. So the interpretation is, um, is sort of more efficient and, and we've got less um, rubbish to, to weed through, so to speak. So the, flow, the way a flow cytometer works is um, it's got the um, hydrodynamic flow, so it enables your cells to be able to put into be put into a single file and pass through the flow cytometer in a single file one by one. We incubate our cells with um, fluorescently conjugated monoclonal antibodies. And these monoclonal antibodies are specific for the different cluster of differentiation markers that you get on different cell populations. So mature B cells have CD19 and CD20 on them. T cells have CD3 or CD4 or CD8, depending on what subset they are. Um, and NK cells, um, typically CD56. So if we wanted to identify those cell populations, we'd incubate the fluorescently um, conjugated monoclonal antibodies with the samples, enabled to, and that would enable us then to pass the sample through the flow and the lasers within the flow cytometer excite those um, fluorescent compounds that are bound to the monoclonal antibody that is then bound to the antigen that we want to look at. Um, and that then emits fluorescence, which is then detected and translated into a plot like this. So your lymphocytes usually sit within this gate here. And then up here, um, you have monocytes typically. Uh, they're very, they're quite big cells, so they would sit more up here. If we remember, we've got size and granularity. And then typically, this is where your neutrophils sit. Um, sometimes if you've got um, dysplastic neutrophils, so they've lost some of their granules, which is common in conditions um, like myelodysplasia, you'd see neutrophils that would move, shift over to the left here because they're slightly less granular than you'd expect. And then this is just um, a plot of one of our tubes on the acute leukemia panel just to sort of give you uh, an idea that actually we can look at multiple markers 
within one panel and it enable, enables us to identify certain cell populations. So up here you've got your CD19 and CD10 positive, which is most likely your B cells. And we use CD45 as a um, as a backbone marker because it's a, a pan-leukocyte marker, so it's on all white cells. So you'd be able to use typically use a side scatter and 45 plot to be able to visualize that. So one of the conditions we look for in immunophenotyping is common variable immune deficiency. So it's a primary immune deficiency that um, results in low levels of antibodies um, and increased risk of infection because you, you're lacking that protection of your adaptive immune system. So it's thought that it's due to genetic abnormalities and mutations, um, but actually the mechanism behind this condition is still very unclear. So just some symptoms, a frequent bacterial and viral infections of the upper respiratory tract, a problem in absorbing nutrients, re reduced liver function, and um, sometimes enlarged spleen and swollen glands or lymph nodes. As I mentioned in the beginning, these are areas where your white cells are stored. Um, and if your body is working um, on overdrive to be able to differentiate more and more B cells or T cells, um, you then end up with um, swollen glands, lymph nodes and large spleen, so um, splenomegaly. So we utilise our memory B cell testing panel. So it's typically patients that have got hypogammaglobulinemia, so low immunoglobulin, and they end up with reduced populations of CD27 positive memory B cells. Um, and we also look at whether the CD27 positive B cells can produce IgM um, and whether they can produce IgD. So um, you have gene rearrangement that allows for a wide repertoire of um, antibodies that are specific to a wide range of antigens, which then obviously allows your immune system to be able to function. But irregular gene rearrangement or abnormal gene rearrangement then leads to B cells that are unable to class switch, so they can't switch from their original isotype um, to a different isotype of antibody secreting cell. Uh, some patients also end up with secondary immune deficiencies from treatment they've previously had. So treatment like rituximab that knocks out your B cells, your B cells then find it hard to recover following treatment. So you then have a reduced amount of antibodies or immunoglobulins present. And then finally, just onto um, histocompatibility and immunogenetics, HNI. Um, just quickly before we wrap up for some questions. So the HNI department is responsible mainly for testing um, for the National Kid Kidney Transplantation Scheme. So we get patients referred to our centres. We're a kidney transplant centre um, that get put on the waiting list for, for a kidney transplant. Um, initially, the idea is that if you need a transplant, ideally you um, firstly would go for a living donation. So hopefully you'd have a relative or a friend who was a close enough HLA match um, to be able to donate. So we'd work the patient and the, and the donors up for um, HLA typing. So HLA is, um, or your major histocompatibility complex is present on the short arm of, of chromosome six. And it's a group of highly polymorphic genes um, that are basically responsible for um, antigen presentation, um, your MHC. So it's designed to, to, in no uncertain terms, cover a range of pathogenic antigens that are common within your um, within your environment, etc. So we find that people of different ethnicities will have very different um, HLA alleles. And this may be due to the fact that actually in different in the different environments they live in, they need to be protected against different pathogens and different peptides than um, than others. But there are um, common HLA alleles within each um, sort of ethnicity group or ethnic group. So we also participate in the National Kidney Sharing Scheme. So sometimes we get a donor and recipient that aren't suitable for each other, but the, the living donor still wants to donate their kidney to someone. So they'll enter a, a sharing scheme, a pair pool scheme, where two pairs can, can sort of donate to each other. So we might have two pairs of people that aren't compatible with each other, 
but the donor from each pair are actually compatible with the recipient from each pair, so they swap. So we participate in both lives and deceased, live and deceased donation. Um, so just last night, actually, I was called into work um, to perform a cross match to determine whether a kidney was suitable for a recipient from a deceased donor. And we also look at pharmacogenetics. So we look at the association between certain reactions to drugs and HLA, certain HLA alleles. Um, and then we also look at disease association. So um, with celiac disease, if you exhibit all of the symptoms um, and your antibody testing has come back positive and you've got the alleles for the uh, DQ2 and DQ8, you are more likely to be suffering from celiac disease. However, it's used more as a test to sort of discount that. So if you're um, exhibiting some symptoms, your other testing doesn't really, is very unclear and you have um, the D you don't have the DQ2 and DQ8 alleles, it's highly unlikely that you will be suffering from celiac disease. So testing, we perform HLA typing to determine your HLA type. Um, we use PCR, polymer polymerase chain reaction for that. Um, we do renal cross matching to, to determine, whether the determine whether the kidney is suitable or not. Uh, we provide 24 seven on call service and we do um, testing for antibodies against HLA. Uh, so that can occur during sensitizing events. So if you've had a blood transfusion that contains HLA alleles that aren't um, the same as self, your body recognises that as foreign and can produce antibodies. Pregnancy, um, HLA um, antibodies are produced during pregnancy as well because um, the fetus or the baby will have inherited some HLA alleles from the father. And some of those may be some that you personally don't have um, and also previous transplantation as well. So this is just a couple of pictures of our lab. We have a pre PCR and a post PCR area. This is just to avoid contamination um, of DNA so that we know that the DNA we have tested and the DNA we have amplified is the DNA for that patient and, and not from anything else. Uh, this is just a quick picture of PCR, I'll run through this quickly. So you have, um, depending on which PCR you do, you denature your, your DNA, your primers that are present. So you have primers that are specific to DNA sequence. Um, during the first cycle, these primers anneal to the complementary strand and then tap polymerase um, and your double, nu your nucleotide uh, proteins come along and they elongate um, the where the primers have bound, producing a complementary template strand. This happens again and again and again until you've got many, many copies. So we used to use PCR SSP, which um, is sequence specific primers. So we used to have to visualize that on an agarose gel. You can see this is um, some work that I did a couple of years ago and, and where we'd have a, a grid to work out um, where each primer was and which allele that would um, subject to positivity. So you can see that we've had some migration. So we'd visualise bioelectrophoresis using ethidium bromide, which is a really, really um, highly carcinogenic compound. So it's nice that we don't have to use that anymore. So primers would be designed so that they either do or do not allow amplification. This is what we use more recently. So you've got a, a mixture of probes that bind to complementary strands of a target exon. So you're coding DNA um, or coding regions of your DNA. You then have buffers, um, primers and nucleotides with your TAC polymerase that are all in a mix. You add that to your DNA. You amplify and then you add your probes that have fluorescent um, compounds on them. So they're able to be um, visualized and patterns of reactivity determined by what we call the Luminex machine. So it's like a mini flow cytometer. It's a similar principle. And then you can see here, these are all um, cutoffs for your probes. And these cutoffs determine whether the probes are negative or positive. And then patterns of reactivity are compared against a reference database, and it can determine your HLA alleles, which are here. And then we use real-time PCR for um, deceased out of hours, deceased donor HLA typing. So we would um, be told that we've got a prospective donor, we'd get blood samples, extract the DNA, and we need to HLA type them so that we could then go and match them against a recipient's um, HLA type. 
So real-time PCR measures in real time, so it's a lot quicker. Your primers bind to your alleles and you've got probes that then bind to the target DNA sequence. TAP polymerase comes along and adds your nucleotides. When the TAP polymerase reaches a probe that's still bound, it digests that, pro digests that probe, which then releases reporter molecule and the quencher that's bound. Um, and the free reporter molecule can fluoresce. This fluorescence is then detected. And again, patterns of reactivity are compared against the database. Um, and we can determine the HLA type from that. We use cross matching um, to determine whether the kidney is suitable or not. So if we've got a patient that's got previous HLA antibodies, um, they've got no antibodies towards the kidney of the uh, donor, but we're just not sure on the clinical significance. Sometimes people do have antibodies towards the donor, um, but we perform a cross match to see whether it's positive or negative. So we look at the reactivity of your B cells and your T cells um, to determine whether there's IgG antibodies present in that sample. Um, and this is just an example of the flow cytometry plot that we use. Um, a strongly positive sample would exhibit fluorescence sort of at this end of the scale. So you'd have high positivity on the IgG scale, but actually this is looking like a negative response. So we incubate um, donor, donor lymphocytes with your patient serum and see if there's any interaction. And then we used to do CDC cross-matching, so complement dependent cytotoxicity. So we'd add lymphocytes to the patient serum and incubate for, for a couple of hours. We'd then add complement and then we'd stain. And if there's any cell lysis, we'd be able to visualize it using a stain called fluoroquench. So it's, I think it's acridamide, orange, and ethidium bromide. So any cells that are dead, you'd see um, in red, and any cells that are alive, you'd see in green. So this is a really, really ideal sort of negative response that we'd like. And then we'd score it on a basis of two to eight based on cell death. We also do uh, HLA-specific antibody testing. So we have beads that have um, antigens of certain HLA, HLA alleles bound to them. You incubate with the patient serum. If there's any antibodies in the patient serum, they'd bind to the beads. You then add a fluorescent, fluorescent conjugate, and that's, been, that's the incubate, and then that binds to the complex. And then that's able to be detected on the Luminex. So again, a flow cytometry principle, um, and that produces another pattern of reactivity, and we can see whether it's positive or negative or not. And then this is just um, a graph of the HLA antibody detection. So we have certain cutoffs that we set, and anything over that cutoff is deemed as positive. This patient was very, very highly sensitized due to multiple pregnancies and multiple transfusions. Um, so you can see here um, the scale changes depending on level of antibody, um, mean fluorescent intensity, and actually this is over 15,000. And so the cutoff would be uh, depending, I think class one is 1,000, class two is 2,000. Um, and so this patient has multiple, multiple antibodies. So they would then be listed as unacceptable antigens for matching, um, which makes it hard to match a kidney to the patient. And then, as I mentioned in the beginning, we do quality management and quality control. So this is just a graph of our um, immunodeficiency screen cell counts, just to show you that we look at, um, look at trends just to make sure that everything's as it should be. Thank you very much for listening. I'm aware, sorry, I'm a bit tight on time. Um, has anybody got any questions? Thank you, Chelsea. Um, just in the interest of time, um, about a minute, so what I'll do is I'll just read the questions out in order. Uh, might be a few that we don't get round to, but if you've got a copy of the chat, then maybe you could respond to them in the uh, chat. Okay, so I've yep. got... Uh, what are the typical working hours in an immunology lab? OK, so I personally, I work Monday to Friday, eight till four, and then do um, about one on call shift a week and then one weekend a month. And we get bank holidays off as well, so quite nice. Is that the same everywhere? Like, do you, you've mentioned on call, but then I know other trusts don't have an on call. Um, so yeah, so I think... Typically, um, immunology labs are are sort of either nine till five thirty or or um, eight till four working hours. I don't. I personally don't know any any immunology labs that do any out of hours working that's not on call if they do it. 
when you do on call what's that is it just for the urgent samples that you need to go in for yeah so it's just for the kidney transplantation scheme so um we'll be at home and we'll be on standby we get paid a rate for standby and then if we're called we go in um and we get paid an hourly rate then for however many hours we work okay thank you and then uh it sounds like this discipline involves many other disciplines do you have to be a specialist to work in immunology not at all no um it I was just, um, I did my placement in immunology. So once I started that, I loved it. I didn't really want to go anywhere else. But we've had people start from biochemistry, from hematology. Um, we're, we're a very sort of man. It, it's good to have background knowledge, but it's not, not, not a necessity at all. Um, I went into my placement with not much immunology knowledge at all. Um, and yeah, we've had many people change disciplines. So, so no. Quite flexible then, I guess. Um, yeah. Thank you. What advice would you give to someone who attends an interview for a biomedical scientist job in immunology? Um, I would say research your trust, definitely the trust that you're um, interviewing for and see which tests they actually do. Most trusts have a test repertoire on, on their website. So you can see just so that when you go to that interview, you know, um, roughly what they do. Um, I interviewed someone and, and the question was, what do you know about our department? And they couldn't tell me anything. And actually that showed me that they'd not researched the job at all, not researched what we did. Um, and yeah, so I think it's a good idea. That's a good place to start. But again, it depends on what sort of grade you're going for. But for, for general quality control is something that comes up quite a lot. Um, you don't need, if it's like a, a trainee or band five, um, role you don't need specialist knowledge in immunology if you want to research just to get a little bit of knowledge you can but it's not it's not essential thanks Chelsea um and actually Christina uh, who was the person that asked this question um we've just done some sessions uh, with the IBMS um so if you go on the IBMS website and look under resources um there's the support hub sessions that are available there so the last one we did was on interview preparation um, and it, it was quite generic, but it, we gave some specific advice in there for um, biomedical science jobs, as well as advice for students who are applying for placements and for new graduates. So that might be something um, that you might want to look at. It is helpful. Um, I'm just quickly skimming through to see if there's any more. There's two more, Chelsea. So I think it could just be really quick and then we can yeah. um, finish off there. So as a graduate, what disciplines... Uh, would I start off from and how would your training progression work? Um, so it, it sort of depends on uh, your preference really um, and what jobs are available. I know that um, and if you've got your HCPC registration um, sorted, I know in sort of a way of trainee positions they are very scarce at the moment um, and, and a bit hard to come by. But I think if you, I focused on my interests purely just because that I knew where I wanted to go. But if you just want to get started in sort of like the BMS job, I would say go for any discipline. If if you really don't like it, you can try and, you know, tr always transfer later. But any experience is going to be valuable and good experience for you. So if you can focus your interests and, and you want to find a job within what you're interested in, then then go for it. But if there's nothing out there, um, but you want a BMS job, then I'd say it really doesn't matter where you start off as long as you start somewhere. Thank you, Chelsea. And then last question, what will your advice for someone who has had some previous theoretical knowledge in immunology and is interested in working in an, an NHS immunohistochemistry lab? Um, I don't have too much experience with immunohistochemistry. Um, but I think some of the testing principles are slightly the same. They do di direct immunofluorescence rather than indirect immunofluorescence. Um, I'd say head to Twitter and LinkedIn because you'll definitely be able to find someone that, that has got the knowledge sort of that can help you. Um, your immunology background will help you a lot because of the principle of the testing but um, I'd also just do some research find some papers online um, have a look at some information um, and then also look keep an eye on the NHS jobs website um, maybe set up some alerts because the, there's always things coming out